moving on to again the possibly uh, you know uh, very very common high rise is not so common i think uh, it does happen but it's quite sporadic uh, in our practice we probably see maybe six a year um, one in two months Uh, it's about as common as a cat rat escaping and not being found so respiratory distress is very very common for this one i don't think i will need dr sharma's help i just want to um say a few things when we talk about res- respiratory distress uh, you can see there are certain terms that we should be aware of one is dyspnea it is difficulty in breathing and it is often characterized in cats by open mouth breathing okay there is tachypnea which is uh, an increased rate of breathing so we know ma'am you are mute hello ma'am i'm sorry i didn't i didn't realize that thank you uh, how much did you all miss did you did you did i talk about dyspnea or i haven't no okay Just so respiratory distress and if you want me to put uh, any video on then just let me know i will let you know it will be the next few videos so if you can be on standby this one is okay um sure. this one i i didn't need volume but thanks for that uh, so a few terms that we must be aware of when we are talking about respiratory distress in cats uh, basic terms one is dyspnea which is difficulty in breathing and it is manifested as open mouth breathing in cats tachypnea is a increased rate of respiration so very fast breathing it's often shallower than normal normal respiratory in cats rate in cats is 30 to 35 per minute hmm? hypopnea is when there is an increased respiratory rate but it may be accompanied by an increased depth so it is fast but deep in in a, as opposed to sh- uh, fast but shallow which is tachypnea and of course there is orthopnea where a cat is you know standing with its legs apart because it uh, or standing up and not sitting down because it doesn't want to put any pressure on its chest when we talk about respiratory distress there is some common and easy things to do when a cat comes in in respiratory distress you don't know why it has come in in respiratory distress but initial stabilization includes oxygen this can be flow by oxygen which is a uh, uh most common or you can uh, use a mask if the cat will accept it or you can use an oxygen chamber minimal to gentle handling you saw the other cat sitting in a towel you will use a towel to handle it but never scruff this cat because it is very very easy to send a cat to watch you must watch the tongue color it gets cyanotic and a cat can collapse when it comes in respiratory distress cardio respiratory assessment should be quick and basic you want your four quadrant lungs to be auscultated your heart your pulses your mucous membrane color and your tongue color these are very important parameters that should be assessed when your cat is on oxygen and stabilized once your cat is a little stable and you're finding you can uh, you know restrain it in a towel or rolled up in a towel without too much of um, you know uh, sort of distress then you can try placing an iv cannula you can put an spo2 monitor or a pulse oximeter because this cat is dyspneic it is not in cardiopulmonary arrest um you can put it on the ear pinna or a foot pad and you can get a reading and that is sometimes helpful and in some cases of a cat is very anxious or very fractious and you know you've put it in a box it helps to use a touch or a very small dose of butorphanol or dexamethasone just to calm this cat down some there's a lot of anxiety associated with not being able to breathe properly especially if it's acute and this does help of course don't forget to take a consent form so talking about common respiratory emergencies one of the ones that i'd like to mention is a laryngospasm we talked in our initial lecture and we are coming full circle back to that to say that laryngospasms are common in cats when we were doing basic techniques we talked about how one must be careful of this for and w- what to do to prevent it and we've talked about that but you've done everything you can and you still have a cat who's spasming and turning blue what are you going to do first is you want to administer oxygen via a face mask then you want to apply topical lidocaine to the larynx and you want to advance a 5 french gauge urinary catheter through the larynx you can't get an etu tube in because the cat is awake and spasming you want to get just this 5 french gauge urinary catheter remember it's part of our crash cart and it has many many uses attach this via a syringe case so what you do is the end of the catheter like when you're pulling out urine from a bladder or whatever it is that you use it for 
you attach the syringe and what you can do is the other end of the syringe can attach to your anesthetic circuit or to your ET tube adapter to uh, the circuit. This is this is quite easy to do. Monitor one of these kept ready in in um, in your crash cart is 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 useful. We use it a lot for birds and uh, turtles as well. You must monitor your SpO2 in case of uh, laryngospasms. And once your SpO2 is more than ninety five percent, then take out your urinary catheter and replace it. So I'm calling these neonatal feeding tubes urinary, you know, the flexible silicon ones uh, that everyone uses to catheterize a male dog, for example. Once 95% or more, then you replace it with a narrow, the narrow is possible, 2.5. You just want to get it into the airway, ET tube, okay? And your lidocaine by this should um, help to calm it down. If it doesn't, administer some propofol, let the cat sleep once you've got the ET tube in, and then slowly, gently wake it up again. So that's your laryngospasm if it does occur. Okay, so this cat had, um, let me show you this video. So if you look at the video, there's a little bit of movement in it, but what it shows you is very thickened uh, 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 arytenoids. And this can be from a previous, maybe calcivirus, chronic inflammation from a calcivirus infection. I just like to show it to you because it was quite abnormal. So you see the bottom is your laryngeal opening. And you see how little it's opening and how thickened those are. So again, you will need a narrower ET tube in this case. And this cat can be prone to spasming. Moving on to possibly our most common respiratory emergency, which is feline asthma, and how we work it up and how to detect it. It's an allergic respiratory disease. It's thought to be a type 1 hypersensitivity response to inhaled allergens, resulting in a spontaneous and reversible bronchoconstriction. And it is an eosinophilic airway inflammation and remodeling. Okay. It's a lot of things. Distinguishing chronic bronchitis in cats from feline asthma can be challenging without examination of airway cytology. Asthma is usually diagnosed in young adult cats with Siamese and oriental breeds being predisposed. So what are the symptoms? The coughing and asthma is paroxysmal. That means it's either daily or intermittent. That means that they cough and the rest of the time they're completely normal. Sometimes there may also be periods of lethargy, exercise intolerance. After playing, they're sitting with their mouth open and breathing for a long time. Definitely think of bronchitis or asthma or airway disease. Episodes of dyspnea due to acute bronchoconstriction with open mouth breathing, hypopnea, tachypnea, uh, wheezing, cyanosis, and collapse is also possible, and that is when it becomes an actual emergency. So, Dr. Sharma, can you play this video, please? Because I'd like uh, the the sound to be audible, and you can hear this is a classic cough um, in an asthmatic yes. Co yes. cat. Just a moment. Okay, so you heard that cough, and this is the, 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 um, okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Sharma. There's going to be one more in a little bit. So, the owner uh, can sometimes confuse, I think he was trying to cough up a hairball. Uh, I think my cat was gagging or vomiting, okay, but an asthmatic, in these cases, am I, Audible, yeah. In these cases, always ask for a video because there is very few things that will cause a cat to suddenly, in the middle of the day, crouch in this position with the head and neck extended, complete contraction of the um, abdominal muscles and cough like this. Okay, There may or may not be any expectoration, so it can be a dry cough and the cat can swallow after that, so you may not see anything, but this is very typical of an asthmatic cough. So this diagnosis of feline asthma is difficult. And being an allergic disease, like all allergic diseases, the diagnosis is, is by exclusion. The hematology can be normal. It can indicate an inflammatory leukogram, show peripheral eosinophilia very rarely. And sometimes it can show nonspecific inflammation by hyperglobulinemia. In all cases where there is coughing and asthma, yes? Your yes. screen is not shared now. Oh, my screen is not shared. Okay, okay. Yeah, better. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So, in all cases, serology for FIV and FELV are very important because these can be underlying factors. Also, important to point out that we know from the Pandora syndrome that allergic respiratory disease is part of the complex in stress induced cats. And it is common in cats who will also have urinary issues or chronic gastrointestinal issues or skin issues. Once the cat is stable for anesthesia, actually, the main diagnosis is by BAL or bronchoalveolar lavage cytology and microbial, PCR, uh, microbial culture or PCR for microplasma felis and bordetella bronchoseptica should be carried out to exclude an infectious cause. So on the left side, I've put a photograph of an ET tube clearly with mucus and a swab that I have used to collect some of this mucus. We used to perform uh, bronchoalveolar lavages in cats under anesthesia. And uh, we already know that their airways tend to be quite hyper responsive and asthmatic cats are established um, hyper responsive in terms of their airway reactivity. So it can be quite tricky. They say that you have to administer terbutalin uh, before you do a bal, and then you put in the same catheter and five French gauge and you instill a little bit of fluid, two to three ml, and then you aspirate it again it can cause bronchospasms in cats and it can be uh, it can have adverse outcomes also uh, in my practice we do not have bronchoscopy so we don't have the advantage of doing it video guided or actually looking at the airways at least we don't do it yet so what we were doing is we were doing a blind bal or a bron bronchoalveolar lavage instead now what i do is once i have an asthmatic cat who is stable he, is on, he or she is on steroids, um, has the cough under control, has been under treatment for about uh, uh, two weeks. I would then anesthetize this cat. I use, instead of terbutalin, it's not always easily available, I do use albuterol or salbutamol, um, even as a puff sometimes. And of course, I will not do it in a uh, cat who is not stable. It would be in a stable asthmatic cat. And under anesthesia, we use a new fresh ET tube. And when we pull it out, when we have this mucus, this is the mucus that we use for testing. And what I, we will talk about what we test for. Okay. So this is just to prevent flushing the fluid in, which I think sometimes causes the reactivity. Whereas in this case, you've established an airway, they do quite well. And usually if they have a fair amount of mucus, when you pull out the ET tube, there is some mucus at the end of it because asthma is inflammation. So there will be some mucus. <clears throat> Diagnosis of feline asthma, we talked about on auscultation, you can hear harsh respiratory sounds, wheezes, crackles, expiratory effort is seen. Sometimes there's an expiratory dyspnea. Um, and auscultation between episodes can be completely normal and this is my experience is that sometimes you can hear a slight wheeze as you can in this cat on the right and what you what you want to listen for is this cat has a very uh, loud strider so you can hear a inspiratory strider but when it's expiring you can hear a little musical wheeze okay when dr sharma plays that video Radiography can be performed and can be normal in an asthmatic cat more commonly a bronchial pattern with typical donuts Okay, donuts and tram lines. So when you look at the bronchi end on in an x-ray, it looks like a circular donut. And when you look at it linearly, it looks like a tram line. Hyperinflation of the lung and flattening of the diaphragm can also be seen. Dr. Sharma, can you play this video, which is video number three? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what I found remarkable in this cat is that without auscultation, you could actually hear the wheeze. So he had quite a severe airway disease, but it's not always the case. Sometimes the owners can hear it when the cat is sleeping. It's an expiratory wheeze, uh, not the inspiratory strider that we heard in that cat. Okay. And 23% of asthmatic cats can have normal radiographs. So emergency treatment of a dyspneic cat is similar in all cases. We discussed this supplemental oxygen bronchodilator like terbutalin or theophylline or uh, salbutamol if you have it, steroids like dexamethasone or prednisolone to reduce airway inflammation is important. 
Longer term management includes inhaled anti-inflammatory steroids like fluticasone propionate, 125 micrograms per cat every 12 hours can be initiated. So what I usually like to do is if I'm going to start, so I've put a photograph here. This is called a spacer. It's called an AeroCat. And AeroCat is the uh, is the company that you know initially made the spacer for cats with asthma. Uh, pediatric in India, you get pediatric spacers as well, which can be used. But the the nice thing about the AeroCat is that they have uh, masks which fit exactly in different sizes. They I think it comes with three sizes onto the cat's muzzle. And uh, there's a little valve over here, and this valve moves when the cat is breathing, so you know that it's inhaling the drug. And at the other end here is your normal MDI, you know, that people use for asthma, the little puck that fits in there. And here is Flohale or Fluticasone, but otherwise you also get a co combination from Cipla, which is Fluticasone with Salmeterol, and that works quite well. Just a quick mention that this 125, there are two uh, uh, sort of, there are two ways to describe this. One is when you get, when you get, when you see dosages that say 110 micrograms uh, per cat, and that is because in the US, they label them according to the amount that the cat is receiving, or it's at the end of the inspiration. Whereas here, sometimes we use the ones which are 250 micrograms, and this is because this is the amount of drug de delivered at the valve, when it is measured at the valve of the puff. So it is not the amount that's going to the ca uh, cat, but even the 250 micrograms is safe to use in a cat. So you can go up to uh, dosages of 250 uh, micrograms every 12 hours. And what I would usually do, this is very safe because you're give, delivering the drug into the lung. You don't have any of the side effects and it can be used long term. The only um, issue is sometimes in an asthmatic cat, it is better to start with oral prednisolone and overlap with one the, once the cough is under control, then it is okay to overlap with the inhaled steroid for 15 days before moving on only to the inhaled steroid and then monitoring every month to see if it can be reduced to once a day. It is important to educate the owner that management of feline asthma can be long term. That means your diagnosis is important. So if it is very mild or the cat is only occasionally coughing, maybe you want to remove uh, environmental control of allergens before you initiate treatment with steroids, but there is no harm in doing a steroid trial to uh, diagnose asthma. Steam nebulization may also help to moisten airways, and some cats may benefit from acetyl cysteine or bromhexene nebulization to assist with mucociliary clearance. Just a quick case, Simba is a two-year-old male neutered domestic short hair, fully vaccinated and dewormed. He was also a little um, obese, which is not visible in this uh, photograph. He had a chronic cough that persisted for three months, but he was very well, very clear, eating well, absence of any nasal drip, chest auscultation, no crackles or wheezes noted, and heart was normal and rhythmic. He did have a bronchointerstitial pattern on radiographs, and CBC and Chemten, which is our basic liver uh, chemistry and uh, kidney chemistry, is normal. So these are his radiographs, and you can see tiny, tiny donuts over here. These are your end-on bronchi. What you can also appreciate is a flattened diaphragm, which shows your hyperinflation of lungs, and sometimes you can see a hyperlucency of the lungs as well. Okay, so increased darkening of the lungs. So he was on a long antibiotic course. First, it was amoxiclav, followed by a third generation cephalosporin. He continued to cough. Uh, we use the Seroflow, which is similar. It's fluticasone and um, salmeterol with the AeroCat and uh, uh, along with oral steroids. He was also given Omnacortil. He was nebulized. He was given L-lysine for chronic, um, you know, herpes virus or, uh, you know, to help with that. We got the owner to remove triggers like scented objects, sprays. We changed to an unscented litter. This is one of the first things that is to be done in an asthmatic cat um, or any allergic cat is you want to change to unscented litter. And there is some evidence that omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids are very, very uh, useful in asthma. And so how am I doing on time? Okay. And reduce airway hyper-responsiveness. So these should be on board. It may be worth considering a hypoallergenic food, even though there is 
not a lot of evidence that food adverse reactions can cause respiratory disease. also do is when we take that swab from the bronchial alveolar lavage we send it for culture and if the owner is willing we do a cytology uh, sorry a pcr and we test for all the respiratory viruses we include fiv felv we include mycoplasma felis which is a respiratory pathogen and we also include fip and chlamydia which can cause uh, respiratory problems. Remember, asthma is a diagnosis of exclusion and is very, very important. Your steroid treatment is probably going to be lifelong. So it is important to not miss infectious causes of chronic bronchitis. This is Simba and he turned out to be actually positive for mycoplasma felis and he was then treated for it. It is a, uh, so the mycoplasma species, the respiratory mycoplasmas live in the upper airways but they're not usually found in the lower airways. And when you do have respiratory signs, they can overgrow and cause problems. So it is important to treat them with four weeks of doxycycline, okay? The other thing that I'd like to mention is, um, what was I going to say? Yes, when we do, uh, the I mentioned asthma and chronic bronchitis. So even in chronic bronchitis, you will get a very, very similar signs to asthma and the cats can continue to do quite well. And the difference is in the cytology of the bronchial alveolar lavage. So when you're actually collecting that mucus for bacterial culture or PCR, it's important to take it on a slide and look at it under the microscope. Because when it is chronic bronchitis, you will see a lot of neutrophils. But when it is asthma, you will see a lot of eosinophils. So they have red granules and they are bilobed nuclei. So this is uh, his repeat radiographs and the lungs are looking a little clearer. And he also continued to do a little bit better. Um, he was coming in for glucose rechecks because he was on a steroid and steroids in cats predispose them to diabetes mellitus. So it's important to keep an eye on the glucose. Uh, he was doing serial radiographs to evaluate his progress. 
And once we had done four weeks of doxy, we confirmed that the microplasma had been cleared by a repeat PCR because the owners were able to afford it. Similarly, this is Sean, an indoor fully vaccinated and dewormed cat who also had asthma. You can see that his blood values are also absolutely normal. And this is very often the case with asthma. And again, ono education is important that a lot of these tests that you're doing will come negative and that they are spending money on them. But it's important that you have that negative to then do the long term steroid treatment that is indicated. So the lateral radiograph you, is not so clear because he's, he's sort of not pulled out or extended properly. But here, I think clearly, I think you can notice these tiny little circular donuts here. And this is your bronchial pattern. And this bronchial pattern is very clear and uh, on uh, the radiograph of this asthmatic cat. And he was also managed um, as, as an asthmatic. And we also ruled out other infectious causes with him. So cyclosporin, other than steroids, has also been used. So some, suppose they are refractory to the steroids or it's not very successful, cyclosporin can be added. But further study is required uh, before its uh, role is fully established. <clears throat> The prognosis is very positive. The only thing that you have to be careful about is sometimes the owner sees that the cat is getting better and automatically on their own stops medication. Uh, they are not so frightened about the cough anymore and they can deteriorate and come in as an emergency. So to the owner education and monitoring and follow-ups are important. So this is a really nice treatment chart that is available online from Trudel Animal Health, who actually makes this aero cat and aero dog, which are the spacers. And it tells you how to manage cats, what are the guidelines, what you should do, what is the, um, how, when you first get the cat, how do you treat the exacerbations, how do you use the inhaler, and I suggest uh, you get hold of this resource. Moving on to our last and most important topic for the day, uh, which we are not going to spend as much time on, but because actually, again, it's a full lecture, but I am going to introduce it very, uh, very quickly, which is the blocked cat. So the owner has called you and we talked about FIC or FLUTD in our first lecture. And the owner calls you saying that my cat is making frequent trips to the litter tray but nothing is coming out. And this can be an absolute emergency because when they're saying this, what you want to ask them is, can you see drops of urine or can you not see anything? Is there any clogged up litter in the tray or is there nothing? Excuse me. <clears throat> so feline lower urinary tract disease is not a specific disease, but rather a term used to describe conditions that can affect the urinary bladder and or the urethra, which is the lower urinary tract of cats, okay? The clinical signs for these diseases are very, very common and very similar. And they include, you know, uh, dysuria, strangurea. We will be talking about those symptoms in a bit. But what is perhaps the biggest cause of lower urinary tract disease in cats, and we discussed this in our lecture on stress, is... Uh, feline idiopathic cystitis or cystitis due to an unknown cause which affects 70% of cases with FLUTD and we don't know the case and this can be quite frustrating but they can be managed like we said with um, environmental management and some supportive medications for the bladder. Today what we are going to actually concentrate on is the blocked cats who come in who may not be FIC because FIC is again when you don't find any cause for it. So you, how do you work up a case of a blocked cat to then establish that it is actually FIC, that there is no actual obstruction and the cat doesn't need emergency treatment. What are the risk factors for FLUTD? The risk factors are middle-aged cats, neutered cats, overweight cats, cats which take little or no exercise, no access to outdoors or and cats that eat a dry diet. So they found that 60% moisture in the diet is necessary to prevent cases of <clears throat> FLUTD. Clinical signs, I, like I said, are very similar. Prevalence is 1% to 3% of cases each year. So 1 out of 100 to 3 out of 100 uh, cases at the clinic will present with FLUTD. I put this photograph because this is a cat with hematuria. And you can see the litter with the clumped uh, patches and some of them are little discolored that it's actually quite difficult to catch hematuria. When a dog urinates, the owner is watching it on a walk or in the house or on a pee pad. 
in cats it is not like that so it is important not to miss this dysuria is difficult or painful urination like respiratory patterns we need to just understand these terms a little bit polaki urea is increased frequency of urination so little 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 lots of little 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 urine polaki urea hematuria is blood in the urine periuria is urinating outside the designated area so if a cat is used to urinating in the bathroom it's urinating somewhere else if it's used to urinating in the litter it's going just outside the litter tray behavioral changes sometimes excessive vocalization sometimes frequent trips to the litter sometimes aggressiveness related to the pain obstructive urolithiasis can be painful strangluria as i mentioned is the biggest emergency when the cat is trying to urinate but there is no urine and it must be immediately brought to the clinic the causes of flutd urolithiasis of course bladder stones or urethral stones and it can account for 10 to 15% of the cases sometimes there are no stones but there are mucus plugs so what happens is the bladder wall is irritated and it produces mucus there is super saturation of the urine and crystals will crystallize out and then along with this mu mucus and proteins it forms an inflammatory plug which is called a urethral plug and the male urethra in cats is as thin as a needle if you imagine the the from the bladder to the outside to the penis tip the urethra is extremely thin so it takes almost nothing for it to get blocked so these urethral plugs which do not show up on radiographs can also cause uh, flutd in cats bacterial infections are quite uncommon in cats as opposed to dogs and if you find a bacterial infection in a cat you must look for an underlying cause so it can be old age neoplasia diabetes mellitus cushing's um, fiv feld these are important uh, comorbidities anatomical defects can be possible of course um, and one of the important things to mention in this is sometimes repeated catheterization of the urethra in cats can sometimes cause strictures and this is an anatomical defect where for the rest of the cat's life then it will continue to have dysuria or painful urination so it's important never to <clears throat> catheterize a conscious cat if it is possible or at least with local epidurals feline idiopathic cystitis despite the well recognized causes of flutd in a majority of cats around 60 to 70% no specific underlying disease can be identified and it is called fic or feline idiopathic cystitis you've got a cat who's come in with strangluria or dysuria how are you going to investigate it of course you will do a clinical examination first with heart rate and look for any arrhythmias survey abdominal radiographs the lateral view including the distal urethra is the most important view and you don't need any other views when it comes in as an emergency minimal database hematology biochemistry and electrolytes and what you want to do is you want to establish whether it is obstructive or non obstructive it is non obstructive you can treat it medically if it is obstructive it might require emergency surgery obstructive ure urolithiasis in the blocked cat incidence ranges from 1.5 to 9% so 1 in 10 cats it can be an emergency it can be due to urolits urethral plugs or it can be due to spasming of the urethral smooth muscles which is functional or idiopathic we mentioned auscultation and arrhythmias when a cat stops urinating it absorbs creatinine and it also gets hyperkalemic because of increased potassium so in one study the combination of hypothermia with a body temperature or rectal temperature of less than 95 to 96.6 degrees f and bradycardia less than 120 beats per minute was 98% specific for severe hyperkalemia more than 8 milli equivalent per liter okay systolic bp is usually normal on presentation and hyperkalemia was also most often encountered with acidosis and low serum ionized concentrations so in these cats stabilization is more important than taking these cats into surgery to remove a calculus and <clears throat> this is a normal ecg this is an ecg with moderate hyperkalemia and this is an ecg with severe hyperkalemia and you can see the st segment and the t wave which is abnormal and this is accompanied by a bradycardia usually and in many cases hypothermia it's important to then go ahead and measure because then your treatment depends on your degree of hyperkalemia or how much your serum potassium is if it is mild and it is less than 6 milli equivalent per liter 
You just need to give fluids to stabilize this cat and you can reassess. If it is moderate, six to eight, then you want to give dextrose, 50% solution, one ml per kg, diluted to 10 to 20%. So 10% dextrose you can give directly also. That's not a problem. And if that doesn't work, you can give regular insulin because it drives potassium intracellular and out of the bloodstream. If you have more than eight and you have a severe hyperkalemia, the reason you have to be careful is because it can be cardiotoxic and your cat can go into cardiac arrest. So it's very important to protect the heart with calcium gluconate at this stage before you do any of the other things. Stabilization of an obstructive urolithiasis cat is by first placing an IV cannula and starting fluids. Your fluid therapy or fluid of choice, even in the face of hyperkalemia, is RL because the cats have metabolic acidosis. So you should not be giving NS, which is an acidic solution. So one, uh, the potassium in RL has been proven to be okay, even in the face of hyperkalemia in cats. Correct electrolyte abnormalities first and have your ECG on for monitoring. Once you have done that, then consider analgesia, sedation, or anesthesia. So sometimes if your cat is recumbent and cannot handle anesthesia, then just analgesia or using an epidural or just performing a therapeutic cystocentesis. And we will talk about this. Removing the urine buys you 24 hours to then stabilize your cat before you do any anesthesia for unblocking the cat. So what are my favorites? Dexmedetomidine and butorphanol combination or midazolam and bupro, buprenorphine combination with or without propofol. <clears throat> this allows me to titrate. So I give each thing at a time or a combination and then I wait to see how the cat does before I give any more. I will have always endotracheal tubes ready, oxygen, emergency drugs, and of course, get the consent form signed. So this is a photograph of a cystocentesis and there is two um, ways to do it. One is a diagnostic cystocentesis and one is a therapeutic one. This is a diagnostic one where with a syringe and needle with your probe on the bladder just in front of the pelvic brim, brim you will go in with your needle. Okay. Uh, if sometimes when you once you are sedated the cat all you need to do is lay it on its side and actually just press the bladder gently and because it's relaxed and the uh, uh, muscles have relaxed you can express urine or if there's a small terminal plug, it will come out on its own. If this is not possible, the next stage is to lubricate, use lots of lidocaine or KY jelly and actually do a penile massage, okay, to get out. And sometimes you'll see this cheesy toothpaste like stuff that comes out, okay. And these are all things that will form. This is not a stone, but a mucus plug. And once this is removed, you can express the bladder quite easily. You may not need to catheterize the bladder. Okay. If you're not able to do this, then therapeutic cystocentesis, where you actually put in a scalp vein and remove the urine. You need two people to do this. You should have two people to do this because one person should fix the bladder against the ventral abdominal floor. Usually I will go in front of the pelvic brim, not at the tip of the bladder because there is always a risk in an over distended very inflamed bladder of the bladder rupturing okay so you want to go closer to the neck of the bladder rather than the apex of the bladder and you want to keep the scalp vein or the butterfly in place while someone is um, removing urine and the reason you need to have someone holding the bladder in place is otherwise as it empties it will move away from the ventral abdominal wall okay so that's a therapeutic cystocentesis <clears throat> Once you've done that and then you want to empty the bladder a little bit before you pass that urinary catheter, because otherwise with the force of passing it from the back, sometimes again, you can cause a bladder rupture. So if you can empty the bladder a little bit, then it is more pliable and then it sometimes makes it easier to pass the catheter in that uh, thin uh, penile urethra. So these are the CAD urinary catheters. There are different types. There are the plain ones. They're the ones with the stylets. And um, I usually use the plain ones with warm saline. So I have a one ml syringe. I have lots of lubrication uh, and I keep flushing while I'm passing it, um, passing the, uh, the catheter into the bladder. It, they have also, we've started, uh, you know, playing around with this atrothurarium bacillate, which is a drug which causes smooth muscle relaxation. And you can use it locally. 
it says 4 ml per cat of a 0.5 mg per ml solution and you instill it intra 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 urethral and you wait for a few minutes and the success rate of catheterization after that improved from 15% to 65% of blocked cats <clears throat> so definitely worth having in your practice once you've removed some urine okay either by catheterization or by cystocentesis you definitely want to do a urine analysis and a culture you want to rule out uh, infectious causes uh, and you must be careful because sometimes you get a post obstructive diuresis which can then lead to a hypokalemia so it's important once you've unblocked a cat to monitor it for the next 12 hours or so 24 hours to monitor for this hypokalemia so urolithiasis is 15 to 20% you usually will see rbc's wbc's and crystals um yeah today is taking long plug can be expressed from the penile urethra and there's two common types of urolits in cats less than 7 years old there is true white which is mildly radi radio opaque and in older cats it's usually calcium oxalate which is much whiter okay and here you can see a plug that is coming out of a cat penis and it's really quite big and this is what it looks like on the tissue paper so this is what the mucus plugs look like management of urolithiasis medical management for struvite urolits is by prescription diets along with antibiotics for 14 days and increasing water intake uh, oxalate cannot be dissolved by diet and it has to re be removed surgically if you have found stones on radiographs and we will see a few radiographs then you will have to remove it by perineal urethrostomy uh, which is basically a surgery where you remove the penile urethra till it goes up to the level of the pelvic urethra which is much wider therefore essentially making a male urethra into a female urethra and lessening the chances of blockages this is the surgery so this is actually the penis and this is the urethra and you can see here are the two bulbo urethral glands so this is the level you have to go up to okay here it is visible again and what you do is once you've gone up to that level you actually open up the urethra and then you suture it onto either side um as like a washboard okay cats do quite well after the surgery so just a few quick cases before we wrap up for today i do apologize for taking a little bit longer than i had it intended to so socrates presented he's a, a 10 year old male neutered um, norwegian forest cat and he presented with dysuria and so i've taken this radiograph and if we were in a presentation i would ask you what was wrong with this radiograph it's a lateral x-ray i said one lateral survey x-ray is quite good the problem <clears throat> with this x-ray is that i have not included the distal urethra so i did another radi radiograph where i did in the first radiograph you can see that there it looks like one kidney is smaller but later on we did two radiographs and this wasn't the case but there is definitely some um nephrolites and the usual nephrolites in cats in addition to being the ones in older cats are calcium oxalate and what you can see is this is the bladder and this is the course of the urethra along the pelvic floor and it comes out here and just at the tip there is a little blockage it is amazing how little it takes to block a cat and cause dysuria and this is something that must not be underestimated and i hope my radiographs will show you a little evidence of that so there's your little plug and this cat was unblocked and continued to do well um uh, no so it was unblocked but when we were unblocking it we could feel that there was still some gritty feeling and a lot of these times they will sit here and become more and more radio opaque but they get embedded in the mucosa and then your only option to solve the dysuria can be a perineal urethrostomy having said that from all the block cats the ones that actually require surgery are very very few so in spite of all the cats we see we do a perineal urethr urethrostomy actually in maybe four cats a year which is <clears throat> a very small number so most of these cats are not uh, surgical cats similarly here i think you've seen this x-ray before this is the pelvic urethra and you can see that there is a fine string of stones that is going out um here is a closer view of the same image I apologize for this uh, line this is an artifact and lastly junior because junior presented as an emergency he was an outdoor cat and he presented with um hang on a second bring up junior here 
Yeah. He was neutered uh, a few years ago and the owner actually was very, very observant considering he's an outdoor building cat and she saw him sitting down and trying to urinate and not being able to urinate. And so she actually brought him in while he was not too decompensated because with outdoor cats, otherwise they will catch them when they're already recumbent and they're hyperkalemic and they often have quite a poor prognosis. So what we saw in the x-ray was a quite a distended bladder. When these cats come in on physical exam, the first thing that you want to palpate, the first thing in history you want to ask is, is the cat, is drops of urine coming out? Because just drops of urine will stop it from becoming an emergency. Whereas if there's no urine at all, you have an emergency. Secondly, when the cat is in hand, you first palpate the stomach. If it is a hard, turgid, distended bladder, probably an emergency. If it is not so big and still a little flaccid, that means the cat's often able to urinate a little bit. Again, you have to treat it, but it may not be an emergency. So the owner found him and came into the clinic um, as an emergency. And what you can see on the radiograph is the bladder is quite full. But if you look very carefully, I don't know if you can appreciate this thin radio opaque line. And sure enough, he was blocked. He also presented with quite high creatinine values. Okay, And he also had a high glucose, which could have been due to stress. We did the urine routine and we found RBCs, pus cells, and triple phosphate crystals. And we did a culture uh, because we were able to get some urine out by uh, cystocentesis. And we found no growth in culture. As we know, bacterial cystitis is uncommon in cats. We did, he did continue to have dysuria in spite. So we did therapeutic cystocentesis one day and we scheduled the surgery um, <clears throat> two days later. But he continued to have a lot of dysuria. And what we saw on the ultrasound was definitely that the bladder was very distended. But we also noticed, this is the wall of the bladder here. We noticed some free fluid outside. You see, all this is all free fluid in the abdomen and a little bit of pyelectasia in the kidney. So what they say is if the, kid, if the pyelectasia is more than 13 millimeters, this is indicative of an ac acute obstruction in cats. And these two lines is what demarcates the renal pelvis. So we saw sludge 2%, no calculi, and pyelectasia. I think these are images after. So we were very worried, and we went ahead and did the uh, perineal urethrostomy. And he did very, very well. And what, we, what I did tell the owner is, look, we are doing the perineal urethrostomy to get him to urinate now. But at a later stage, we might have to go in and do a cystocentesis if the bladder is actually ruptured. But I monitored the bladder, and already... 24 hours after, the fluid, free fluid is much less and went on to get completely resolved. So I just want to mention this because sometimes when you are evaluating a blocked cat because of the bladder wall edema uh, or inflammation, it gets more permeable and you will see some fluid outside the bladder. This does not mean that you have ruptured the bladder with your cystocentesis. It can purely mean an inflamed, leaky bladder, and then this should go ahead and resolve. In some cases, if it gets worse or quickly increasing the amount of fluid, then it is an indication for you to go in and do an emergency cystocentesis as well. So also urethral plug workup, similarly, you must have. So this is a, you can't see anything here, but this is the same cat, Casper, that I showed you the massive penile plug in. So these are difficult cases, but very, very important to evaluate every case of FLUTD with radiographs and a workup. So this is Casper. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope it didn't get too uh, long and boring for everyone. <laughs>
डॉक्टर विशाल शर्मा फाउंडर एंड मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर ओरिहिल लाइफ साइंसेज एंड पेट्स प्लेनेट इंडिया पेट हॉस्पिटल्स आई स्टार्टेड पेट्स प्लेनेट इंडिया पेट हॉस्पिटल्स इन 2001 थाउजेंड वन एंड एज आई वॉज अ प्रैक्टिसिंग वेटनेरियन सो ड्यूरिंग माई प्रैक्टिस आई फाउंड अ ग्रेट नीड ऑफ सम सेफ एंड इफेक्टिव मेडिसिन फॉर सम क्रॉनिक डिजीजेज लाइक क्रॉनिक किडनी फेलियर हेपेटाइटिस लिवर सिरोसिस एटोपिक स्किन डिसऑर्डर्स एंड टिक फीवर एंड मैनी अदर एलिमेंट्स सो एट दैट टाइम दीज काइंड ऑफ मेडिसिन वर नॉट अवेलेबल सो आई रिसर्च अ लॉट एंड स्टडी द अवेलेबल स्टडी मटीरियल एंड आई टुक द हेल्प ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स एंड वी डेवलप सम फॉर्मुलेशन फॉर पेट्स एंड बाय दैट द ओरी हिल लाइफ साइंसेस केम इन टू एक्सिस्टेंस नाउ आई प्राउडली टेल यू दैट वी हैव हंड्रेड प्लस पैट प्रोडक्ट्स एंड मेडिसिन एज अवर रेंज एट ओरी हिल लाइफ साइंसेस our priority is our patients and our profession our mission is to develop most affordable and most innovative pet medicines and pet products and we want to add value to our indian veterinary industry our goal is to become a global healthcare organization and we want to bring indian veterinary industry at par with international standards thank you for being a part of this incredible journey thank you